Hi everyone, uh, Josh here from Attitudes Entertainment Company and Team Kaizen. As some of you may know, we give talks across the country to both teachers and students about how video games and game entrepreneurship and game development can lead to 21st century job skills as well as be a benefit in the classroom. To give these talks, instead of using PowerPoint, we use this video game that Sony Computer Entertainment created called Little Big Planet. And we so basically build these PowerPoints inside of Little Big Planet. We call them Planet Points. This one is our speed talk on the benefits of game design and game entrepreneurship in the classroom. And for our first slide, we need to send a shout out to Michael Cassens of University of Montana. He actually told us we should put this slide in, and this slide is Augment. Meaning, if you're looking at incorporating video games into what you're doing, please understand that we're not trying to say that you should take your books, your multimedia, your videos, or your other teaching methods and completely throw them out the window. Video games can work best in the classroom when it's augmenting a pre-existing program, not when it's trying to replace it completely. But the first benefit of video games is they can show very big concepts in very accessible ways. For instance, if you create a model of the universe inside a video game, you can have your players explore the universe in a way that helps them understand the vastness of it better than a picture on a page of a book or a potential video might. Another great thing is they teach 21st century job skills. And that's really important because basically all the major jobs in our country are leaning towards digital work some way or another. Even ones that are traditionally more manual labor are getting more and more computer involved. So the more people become comfortable using computer systems and navigating them, the better. Also, video games offer a really great thing called safe to fail environment. In a video game, if you screw up, all the game does is asks you to try again and you're allowed to retry the problem but explore a different solution. So for instance if you had a very dangerous job like let's say uh, flying a plane or training someone to be on a bomb defusal squad, if you have them learn in a digital simulation or a game first they can feel free to fail and understand what a failure is in that kind of sense without risking life, limb, or expensive property. Also it offers a new form of expression for both teachers and students. Uh, for teachers, you can create new immersive experiences or, in some cases, purchase those new immersive experiences to help explain what the uh, what you're trying to teach better. And sorry for that little goof right there. For students, uh, you can teach them something through both video games and also through other media and then task them with creating video game experiences that show what they learned and apply what they learned, which means they immediately have to take ownership of what they're learning, reinterpret it, and express it correctly to someone else. There's our logo again really quick. Now, first thing we're going to talk about here is pre-made games. Pre-made meaning you go to the store, you buy it the way it is, you don't really have any control over it. The benefits of them is they're an easy fit. If it's the exact content that you're wanting, it will fit into your program exactly the way it says on the box. And you don't really have to think about it twice. And by the way, one of the most famous games that people always talk about when they talk about pre-made educational games is like Oregon Trail or Math Blaster, those kind of games. One of the downsides, though, is you're at the developer's mercy. For instance, a lot of the games uh, that were popular when I was in school, uh, FYI, I graduated high school in 2002, a lot of the educational games that teachers used when I was going to school, like Where in the World is Carmen Sandiego, Oregon Trail, uh, Odell Lake, all those developers are no longer around, which means if it's later found out that the game that they made has incorrect or outdated information, then we have to create additional materials where you hand your students a packet saying, okay, the game's going to tell you this, but that's wrong. Here's the correct information. Like, for instance, if you had a game about astronomy that called Pluto a planet, you would have to explain to your students why that's no longer the case. And you would have no way to change that because pre-made games have no UGC tools. UGC stands for user-generated content. And since user-generated content tools don't exist for those games, there's no way for you to dig in and fix it even if the developer is gone. So now we're going to cover UGC games. As soon as I can get down the pipeline. So UGC games, of course, like I just said, are user-generated content. Famous examples include Little Big Planet, Minecraft, Second Life, any game that gives people tools to create their own content and insert their own content into the game. Now, 
a benefit is they're upgradable. So if you made a presentation that said that there was nine planets, you can go in and correct it to be eight. So you don't have to explain to your students why this presentation is saying nine. You can just go in and fix it and it's correct again with the latest scientific or historical discoveries. And also it gives you a new way to present, play, and design for both teachers and students. Like I mentioned in the expression slide, for teachers you can create immersive experiences that really bring the students in and show them things on a scale that maybe would be harder to do in other media. And for students, it gives them a wider range to express the knowledge they've learned and take ownership of it. One of the downsides though is you gotta learn an editor. In the case of Little Big Planet, we actually teach a program that we call Little Big Planet Club, where we teach kids game design using Little Big Planet 2 as a development medium. And in the case of that, we've created our own custom curriculum that gets them using the editor roughly in eight to 10 hours, like taking them from complete newbie to comfortable creating. So you gotta figure at least eight to 10 hours to learn a UGC games editor. And that's probably the same roughly for stuff like Second Life and Minecraft as well. And keep in mind that it's also going to be a time constraint if you want to teach your students how to use the editor so that they can create projects based on the subject matter. And lastly, any involvement of video games in the classroom, I would highly recommend it should be paired with a lesson on personal branding. Basically, if you're trying to get people excited about the science, technology, engineering, math, and job opportunities in the video game industry. Uh, you're getting them excited about an industry that has a lot of personal branding in it. And what I mean by that is, like in our industry, if you, even if you're like a quote unquote bottom of the rung artist or programmer, you're still part of a team and you're still going to all these expos around the United States and around the world, like Electronic Entertainment Expo, Gamescom, Tokyo Game Show, PAX. And if you're going to those expos, you're representing your company, you have a badge with your company name on it, and you're waiting in line to play other people's games, and you're standing next to fans, to international media, to members of other studios, to investors, and it's gotten to the point where people have to be really aware of, of branding and how to present, and not just like, oh, how to pitch in 30 seconds, you know, an elevator pitch, which is important, but also just how to behave in the public sphere. We always give talks to students about how like for instance, as a studio ourselves, when someone applies to us, we actually will go look at their Facebook and their Twitter feed and see how they treat other people and how they interact. Because if we bring them on staff and put a badge on their chest that says they're part of us and they go and treat someone like dirt, that comes off as if we're okaying that behavior and that could sink our ability to get fans, it could sink our ability to get investment to get our games made, it could sink our ability to get publishing deals. And there are some really serious things that have happened in our industry that are great example, or I shouldn't say great, but like very vivid examples of why people should always be aware of personal branding. And we tell people it's not about censoring yourself. It's about realizing that when you're out in the public, whether it's at an expo or talking to people on Facebook and Twitter, it's a public sphere and you should behave in a way that truly reflects who you are and who your company is. And for instance, we tell students that any individual quote, Facebook post or Twitter tweet could be someone's first impression of you and you want it to be an accurate first impression. Especially if you're trying to get a job in an industry that is very worried about public persona. Like I'll just give a quick example that um, there's a video game called Left 4 Dead and it's made by a group called Turtle Rock. And uh, earlier this year, uh, one of the members of Turtle Rock went on a Twitter rant about that NBA owner who made some racist comments and I'm not going to go into the details of what he said. He just said some stuff that was definitely kind of controversial, definitely kind of salacious and kind of in a sort of an attack mode. And Turtle Rock took to Twitter and publicly fired him because they didn't want to be involved in it. And long story short, like Turtle Rock was basically in the right in doing what they did. It was that he went well above and beyond what his argument would have supported. So... That's what we try to get across to students. It's not about censoring yourself. It's not about not being who you are. It's about realizing that what's appropriate and when it's appropriate to say it. And another thing that I would include is just really forcing on students stuff that like Twitter and Facebook are not private. They're very much in the public sphere. Anything you do on there could come back to haunt you. And also um, back to the 30 second elevator pitch. It's a great idea if you're having your students create their own artistic content to have them do elevator pitches to each other where they get up in front of the class for their project and try to sell the classroom on it in 30 seconds. 
And if you want a great quick way to teach people elevator pitching, have them read the backs of the cases of their favorite games, because the back of a case to either a game or a movie or a book is an elevator pitch. So now we're going to go ahead and open it up to questions and answers. And we'll go from there. Thank you.